Good morning or afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. You are in the Activating Annotation in Canvas Fall Workshop. This workshop is for folks who are relatively new to Hypothesis. We're going to be spending the next 35, maybe 45 minutes looking at what Hypothesis is and how you would set up a Hypothesis-enabled reading for the first time in Canvas. So best case scenario is that if you have your own Canvas environment at hand, perhaps consider opening up Canvas and um, doing what I'm doing alongside me. So I'm going to show you how to set something up. So feel free to have your own assignment that you're working with, maybe on another screen or in another window at the same time, if that works for you. The goal is that you'll walk away from today feeling confident that you can um, set up a hypothesis enabled reading on your own. So we are recording this workshop and we'll send a recording of the webinar either later today or tomorrow. Um, and again, uh, I'll put the slide deck URL in the chat. It's full of resources that hopefully will be helpful for you as you uh, launch Hypothesis in your own course. So we have Becky and Christy here today. Um, they're here to man the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat as we go along. Um, and they are there to answer any questions as they come up. So um, let's start with some introductions. If you can put in the chat, your name, your school, your discipline, and what your experience is with Hypothesis. I always like to start by getting a sense for who all is here today. If you have no experience with Hypothesis, that's great. If you've used it before, uh, let us know in the chat. And make sure that when you are typing in your message, set it to display to everyone rather than just hosts and panelists. That way we can all see your message. And a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jessica Fuller. I'm a customer success manager here at Hypothesis, and I'm located near Portland, Oregon in the Northwest. Um, welcome, Megan. Cal State Northridge. Awesome. Wow. Okay, cool. Facilitating first training next week. Excellent. So, Megan, if you have any questions uh, that would be helpful to you as you're facil facilitating the training, feel free to put those in the chat. That's great. All right, um, I like to start with a quote as a teacher. That's um, something we frequently like to do. So if you would take a moment, please, just to read this quotation to yourself. So as teachers, um, we all want our students to think critically about texts. And with a tool like Hypothesis, with the social annotation tool, um, what we're doing is giving students the opportunity to think more deeply about the text that they're reading, but to do so together um, and to do so in a way that's actually helping build community and helping them make connections at the same time. Um, and a tool like Hypothesis allows you to get a window into your students thinking in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. So hopefully this is inspiring to you. Um, and I hope that you walk away from today feeling like social annotation is a way you can really both deepen your students thinking about texts and help them build community at the same time. <clears throat> so um, I'm actually going to launch a poll to see um, when it comes to reading, hold on, let me go ahead and launch this. What do you struggle with most when it comes to students reading? So if you can let us know what's, what's the thing that stands out as most challenging to you when it comes to students reading? Is it knowing whether or not they did the reading, figuring out what they most or least understood, um, getting them to dis discuss the reading uh, with each other, pointing them to main ideas and concepts, getting them to make connections um, or something else. Or maybe you're just really great and you don't struggle with this at all, which is also totally fine. Let us know. All right, so knowing whether they did the reading here, I'll go ahead and share these results with you. Knowing whether they did the reading and getting students to make connect connections to other courses text, et cetera, is, is the most challenging thing. I can totally relate to that as a former um, English language arts teacher at the high school level. 
yes, I was always wondering, okay, did anyone actually read this? And getting them to make those connections was super challenging to me. Um, and I wish I would have had hypothesis back when I was a teacher, but alas, I, I didn't. Okay, great. So hopefully today's session will help address these two things. Um, and my goal is that by using hypothesis, um, you will better be able to know whether your students did the reading and, and you'll be able to actually help them make those connections. All right, so the three tenets, as we like to refer to them, of hypothesis are that it helps make reading active, visible, and social. And active um, in the sense that when you're assigning something like a hypothesis enabled reading to students, it encourages them to dive more deeply into the actual act of reading itself. So what you're doing is encouraging students and requiring them actually to engage with the text on a deeper level, to think creatively about it, to have conversations with each other. Um, hypothesis helps students just read more carefully. Hypothesis also makes reading visible in that it makes it more obvious to you as an instructor, whether your students actually did the reading for number one. And it also makes it more visible to you where they're having questions, um, maybe getting confused, what parts of the text they're relating to or really enjoying and what parts of the texts are spurring the most discussion or ideas, for example. And hypothesis also makes reading social. And I really like this quote from the student at Plymouth State who says that hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy with this brilliant, brilliant tool? I know I'm not alone. Um, I really like that, especially in these last several years as we've all been more isolated. A tool like this can help students connect with each other while also still being embedded within the context of the text itself. And so it can also be um, a way for students to feel a little bit less alone in the challenges that they may have while they're reading um, and have a window into each other's thinking. <clears throat> and also a tool like this allows them to engage with each other and have those interesting conversations. So digital annotation is powerful because it helps anchor instruction in a student-centered way so students are the ones that are pushing the conversation forward with a tool like this. They're identifying the places in the text where they have those questions and where they wanna have that discussion. And it also allows them to bring their own experience into their reading and to share that with each other. And if you're like allowing things like multimedia, bringing in images, links, videos, students are connecting with what they relate to and they already know and bringing those things to the text. It also allows you to build a community around shared critical reading of text. So <clears throat> not only is this a social community, but it's an academic community. So students are getting to engage with each other in an academic way um, and in a way that's based on the content of your course. Digital annotation also <clears throat> enables student learning in a variety of environments. So whether you're teaching online or in person or a mixture of two of those things or whatever your course looks like this year. Um, hypothesis and digital annotation in general are useful in all of those contexts um, and help students connect regardless of where and how they're meeting. And digital annotation also makes thinking visible to others. So it allows students to kind of see each other's thinking um, and sometimes even see like their instructors thinking if you're doing something like a guided reading, which can help kind of model different ways of reading and thinking for your students. You may have seen these resources before, but all of these um, links in the slide deck are live links that are designed for you to be useful. Um, these are resources you can share out with your students if you want. Um, these top three, I should say. So we have an annotation etiquette for students. So it's a guide for how to write a good and meaningful annotation. We have another guide to the different types of annotations you can make. And then a resource on how to add images, videos, links to annotations. So all of these top three are, are for students. And then on the bottom here, we have some partner created resources, which would be more a resource for you as an instructor. There's some really cool content in here that our other partners at other schools have created and allowed us to share out with you. So you can see example assignments, um, resource pages, 
all sorts of cool things that other instructors have created, and then examples of classroom use of hypothesis there. All right, so how do you actually use hypothesis in your classroom in Canvas? That's what we're, what we're gonna dive into next. Um, so in Canvas, students are automatically signed into hypothesis. This is an image of a hypothesis enabled reading in Canvas. Students do not have to take an extra step to create a hypothesis account or anything like that. Um, we will grab just the student's first and last name from the LMS itself, and that will automatically show in the hypothesis annotations as you see here. So John Udell, this name is the name of the student in Canvas. It comes through automatically. And in Canvas, a private kind of group situation is created for your course. So when students annotate um, a document in your course, those annotations are only going to be visible to other students in the class, and that's set up automatically for you um, by the hypothesis tool. You can also very conveniently grade annotations in Canvas using SpeedGrader. So once you configure your assignment to be gradable, um, when you click the speed grader button, it will automatically kind of filter out to each student's unique contributions that you're seeing on the left here. So the student teacher's pet has made these three annotations or two annotations and one reply that you're seeing here. And then on the right, you can give that student a grade, give them comments and then submit right there. So it's a really nice and convenient way to easily view what each student has contributed, give them a grade, submit, go on to the next person. All right, so what can you annotate? With Hypothesis, you can annotate any web page and online article. So anything that is publicly available online, you can annotate with Hypothesis, but I will give two caveats with that. And those are um, web pages should be both open and stable. Open means that you wanna make sure that any online web page you're annotating um, is not behind a paywall. If it is, unfortunately, Hypothesis is not able to break through that, your students won't actually have access. Um, unless you download that article um, and make it available as a PDF. So the other thing with, with web pages is you want to make sure that they are also stable. Um, and that means make sure that the URL is not going to change or be updated by the time your students go to annotate. So for example, if you used um, a URL pointing to the Poetry Foundation poem of the day, that page is gonna change on a daily basis and the same URL is gonna have different content every day. If you had your students annotate that, it would be a different poem on Tuesday than it was on Wednesday. So probably not a great URL um, to annotate in your course with Hypothesis. And in that case, again, I'd say, go ahead and download that poem and use it as a PDF instead. So PDFs are the second type of content that is annotatable with Hypothesis. Almost anything can be turned into a PDF. So if you have a Word document or a slide deck, a presentation, et cetera, all of those types of documents can easily be turned into a PDF and then any PDF is annotatable with the tool. You can also annotate open textbooks and OER and we are working on integrations with JSTOR and Vital Source with more to come in the future that we're really excited about. Yeah, welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Christy, for sharing that uh, URL to the slide deck. Much appreciated. All right, so what can you put in an annotation? There are lots of options for ways students can annotate, um, and it's pretty cool. Um, all these different options really do give students the ability to kind of bring what interests them into the conversation, whether that is just text, which is the most common thing we see, whether that's a URL. So you can do hyperlinks in the annotation sidebar. There is tagging, which can be a really powerful um, kind of ped pedagogical way to use the tool to get students to kind of metacognitively reflect on what they're doing while they're annotating. There are emojis. You can link to images. So images, any other, any image that is out there on the internet um, at a URL, you can link to in um, the annotation sidebar. You can also link to videos. And if you are a math person, 
there's the ability to do uh, LaTeX equations, which I don't know how to do, but <laughs> for those of you that do, that is available. And here are some resources that are Canvas specific. Um, we have a pretty robust and awesome help center and knowledge base that is full of how-to articles. So please feel free to come back later and refer to any of these resources. We've got YouTube videos as well as um, just written articles showing you how to set up a reading in Hypothesis or sorry, in Canvas. Um, how do you could um, learn how to do group sets in Canvas. There's a student guide, an article on grading and much, much more. So again, feel free to come back to the slide deck later if you need to find um, these articles in the future. Oops. Oh my goodness. All right, so I'm actually gonna step away from the slide deck now. Um, before I do, because my next step will be to actually show how to set up a hypothesis enabled reading in Canvas. Before I do, are there any questions at this point? If there are, feel free to put them in the chat. Take a moment here to pause to see if there are any questions. Okay. Um, so in the slide deck, there are a bunch of um, screenshots and instructions for how to set up an assignment in Canvas. I'm not going to go through them. I'm actually going to go into Canvas itself. But just know that if if you watch this presentation and then forget it tomorrow, that's totally fine because you can come back to the slide deck and all of the steps are here with nice screenshots for you. All right, so I'm going to hop into my own uh, kind of Canvas demo environment. If you want to pull up your own Canvas environment on another screen and kind of walk through this yourself while I'm doing this, please feel free. Um, but I'm going to start by just showing you um, how to set up an assignment in general. Um, and to do that, what you're going to do is go to the assignments tab. If you try to set up a reading here in the modules view um, by using this little plus button, you won't be able to link your hypothesis reading with SpeedGrader. So that's why we say you want to start here on the assignments tab. <clears throat> However, if you want to use group sets, with your assignment. You would actually not start here on the assignments tab and would start on the people tab. So for the purpose of those of you who may want to use groups, I'm actually gonna start here and briefly show you how to set up a group set. So reading in small groups can be really powerful for students. When you break them up into smaller groups, sometimes it can be more empowering for students to, to share more because there's less competition um, for making comments and saying interesting things. So sometimes it's more freeing to have a smaller group. So in order to create a group set, you're going to start on the people tab um, and click plus group set here to actually create a new group set. You're going to give it a name. So I'm going to name it for this particular assignment that I'm about to set up. So I'm going to say uh, Emily Dickinson reading groups. And then you're going to designate the group structure that you want. You can split students by number of groups or number of students per group. And in this case, I'm going to say number of groups because I want just two reading groups here. I'm going to click Save. And it's going to automatically assign my students two groups. You can see here I have three students in reading group one and two students in reading group two. OK, great. Now that I've done that, I'm going to step away from group sets and actually go back to my assignments group here. So to create a hypothesis enabled reading, you're going to start by just clicking the add assignment button. I'm going to give my assignment a name. So let's say annotating poetry. I'm a former language arts teacher here. So all of my assignments are, are going to be probably poetry uh, related um, here in my example. Annotating poetry, Emily. Dickinson. And I'm going to put some instructions in here. Okay. Once you have some instructions, you can configure the amount of points you want your assignment to be worth, configure some other kind of grade related items here. 
The critical piece is in this submission type section. So for submission type, you want to make sure you select external tool. And then for external tool options, you're going to click this find button. And I imagine that your view here is going to look different than mine. So typically schools will have many possible external tools. I only have a few here. Um, you're going to select hypothesis. And then once you select hypothesis, several options are going to become available for you. This is where you're going to select um, whether you're asking students to annotate a web page. Um, you could select a PDF from your Canvas files. You can also select a PDF that's stored in your Google Drive or OneDrive down here. Um, and here, I actually have the ability to also select a JSTOR or Vital Source article. Um, these are two uh, options that are still in beta, so you may not see them um, at your school, but if you are interested in either of these things, let your customer success manager know. All right, so for the purpose of this assignment, I'm going to select um, URL here because I'm going to have my students, my imaginary students, annotate this oops, poem by Emily Dickinson. Let me grab it here. So there's my URL. I know that the Poetry Foundation is a stable website. This is um, a URL I'm confident is not going to change by the time I have my students annotate this. So I'm feeling confident about it. And here's where if you want your students to read in reading groups, you would say this is a group assignment. And the reason I started by setting my group set up very first is because on this step, you actually have to have your reading group set up prior to this point. So since I took a moment to set up my Emily Dickinson reading groups, I'm going to select that here and click continue. And then down here at the bottom, we do always recommend that you check this box to load the assignment in a new tab, just for the reason that this is going to give your students the maximum amount of real estate when they're actually reading and annotating. And if they're on a small device, if you don't load it in a new tab, it can be very squished and difficult to actually navigate the article and the annotations at the same time. So we recommend that you check this box. I'm going to click select. And I'm going to save and publish. So now here's my assignment. Um, to load it, you're going to click this button. Since I said load in a new tab, I do have to click this extra button down at the bottom to load my assignment in a new window. And there we go. We have the poem on the left here. And then on the right, we have the annotation sidebar. Um, this tool is designed to be extremely simple. We want it to be very, very easy for students to encounter this for the first time and go ahead and annotate. You can see here, since I set up reading groups, I have the option to view uh, annotations from each reading group. This is reading group one and this is reading group two. There's no annotations here yet, obviously, so there's nothing different to see here. But if students had annotated, I would then see a total, totally different set of annotations on the right here for these two different reading groups. So creating an annotation is very simple. All I'm going to do is select some text on the left. And when I do, I have the option to annotate or highlight. And if I click annotate, it opens up this nice area on the right for me, it's pulled the text that I highlighted here on the right um, and shows that I selected thing with feathers. And then down below that, I can type my annotation. Is this supposed to be a bird? OK. Um, and here's where students can, they can bold or put things in italics, do a quote. This is a hyperlink option. Images, here's the LaTeX math um, option, et cetera. I could also tag this if I wanted to. So I could say, I'm going to tag this as a question. And that's going to put this question tag on my annotation. And then when I'm satisfied with what I've typed here, I can post my annotation to the class by clicking this gray button at the bottom. I do want to point out that students also have the ability to post annotations privately only to themselves by clicking the only me option with the lock next to it. Just note that if they do that, 
you as the instructor will not be able to see their annotations or grade them. Um, and so if you want to, do, to be able to see what your students are saying and grade them, make sure they know to post to the class. So when I do that, my annotation now displays here. Um, any questions about those configuration steps I just took? I'm happy to go back and show anything again if, if I did any of that too quickly. Okay. Oh, Kathy, did you have a question? Looks like your hand is up. If so, feel free to put that in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and actually show you um, a different assignment that I set up previously that actually has some annotations on it so you can see what it looks like when more people have actually annotated um, a document here. So this is another poem um, that we annotated as a test the other day. Um, I just want to explain a few of these options that are available in this annotation sidebar on the right. So this caret up here, kind of the upper right area, allows you to drag the annotation sidebar over um, to make the reading and the annotations fit best in whatever screen you are using. Okay, Kathy, so your question, is it a bird shows as the actual question for them to answer or do you have to set that up in a typical Canvas assignment? Okay, great question. So that would show as an actual question for them to answer in the annotation sidebar. You don't have to set that up. Although if you wanted them to answer those question, a particular question or two in their annotations, you could also put particular questions here um, in the instructions for the assignment. It really just depends kind of how you want them to view that question. If you want to view it within the actual annotations and actually reply to you as a threaded discussion over here on the right, I would suggest actually adding the question as an annotation. Um, as you can see here on the right, we do have some conversation going here. So if I'd asked the question here, for example, students could reply to me in line here. Whereas if you ask it over here in the actual instructions for the assignment, then you're going to see students annotations kind of separate from your question. Does that help? <clears throat> Let me know if that didn't quite make sense. I'm happy to um, further explain as well. Um, okay, great. So up here in the top, there is a magnifying glass. This is a search feature. It's a pretty robust search tool. You can search for things like a student's name. If I search for a particular student here, it's filtering down and showing me just that student's actual annotations here on the right. And I can use this clear search button to clear out my search. You could also search for tags, um, or I'm going to search here to see if anyone tagged anything as a question, which they did. Actually, I, I did. <laughs> so I knew that I had these tags in here. So now it's showing me um, places where students tagged annotations with the question tag. Um, you can also use these up and down arrows to resort annotations. Um, they will by default sort by their location on the page. Let me clear this actually so you can see all of them. <clears throat> and what that means is that the annotations at the top are going to correspond to like the earliest parts of the article. So that as you scroll down, um, the annotations you see here correspond to commentary that goes with later and later places within the article. But you can also say, I want to see the oldest annotations first or the newest annotations first. So say a, a student um, let you know that they you know, missed the deadline or they added their, their annotation late to the assignment, you could say, all right, sort by newest, and then that students would appear at the top here because they were the most recently applied annotations. 
Uh, so Kathy's question, what are the other tag options besides question? That's an excellent question. Tag options are totally up to you. So the sky is the limit. Basically, as students are adding tags, they are creating them. So anything um, here, so let's say, if I add an annotation, say I have a question about this. Anything I type here in the tag bar will become a tag. So if I say like, this is a new question and hit enter, that's not a tag. I could create a tag for like alliteration um, or simile, et cetera. So there's, there's no pre-created tags essentially is what I'm trying to say. Um, students can create them. You could also tell your students like, here's the four tags I'd like you to use um, and set those guidelines ahead of time. It's really up to you. Um, the first time a student annotates, this help box will display for them, telling them instructions for how to create an annotation. If there are technical issues, you can always have students file a support ticket um, if there are any problems. And a few other notes here, um, this eyeball icon, um, you'll see, all of this yellow highlighting on the left. The yellow highlighting corresponds to a place that someone has made an annotation. But let's say you have an article and it's full of annotations, lots of yellow highlighting. If that is distracting for you as a reader, you can click this eyeball icon and all of the highlighting will be hidden. And then you can click it again and then it is viewable again. Um, any, any other questions? before I hop over to show a uh, speed grader. Okay. So if I wanted to go in and, and grade my students, you would come back here to the assignment itself and click this speed grader button. Okay, Megan has a question. How would you configure hypothesis reading if you didn't want grading involved, just participation? You would actually configure it exactly the same way. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Um, and either not add grading options or you would go here to the modules view and add it here with the plus sign to the module itself. Thanks, Becky. So if I click speed grader here for my assignment, it's going to automatically um, pull up for me um, each student individually. So here I see Jeremy as a student. He contributed three annotations that I can see here on the left. And I can easily say, OK, I'm going to give him 9 out of 10. Here are some comments for you and click Submit. Um, and this allows you to give students feedback on their annotations if need be. OK. I'm going to pop back over to my slide deck. Unless there's anything you'd like me to show again, I'm happy to go back in and show anything a second time. I know that was kind of a lot in a short period of time. Yeah, thanks, Christy, for that comment, too. And you can check the option for not counting something toward the final grade. That's cool. OK, um, I'm actually going to launch another poll here before we end our webinar. I want to know, how are you feeling about using Hypothesis? So take a moment um, and let us know, are you feeling overwhelmed? Do you think, OK, you're fairly confident with some practice, you'll be all right. Maybe you're uber confident and you've used this several times before. Um, let us know. Give it another couple seconds here. If you do feel like you need more help, um, your success manager is more than happy to meet with you or um, help you out one on one. Um, okay, it looks like 
we're a little bit all over the board. That's great. Um, as customer success managers, we are here for you. So our job is to help you feel empowered uh, to use this tool. So if you find yourself feeling a little overwhelmed, you are not alone, but just know that we are here to help you. So you are you can schedule time with your customer success manager for a one-on-one -on -one, um, meeting, or we're also ha happy to help over email as well, whatever is most convenient for you. So I wanted to end um, on that note actually by sharing resources. So what's the next step if you need assistance or need help, need ideas? Um, just know that you are in the company of many, many other schools that are also using Hypothesis. We have an extensive knowledge base and, and great technical support available for you. Um, this link takes you to our knowledge base that I mentioned previously. There are just tons of great content in there. There's how to's for doing basically everything you would ever need to do with the tool in Canvas. Um, we also have tier one support for you and your staff um, and students that run into issues. So this is our support email address. And we will escalate any issues to our dedicated team who are happy to help you. So as far as pedagogical support goes, we have guides available for how to use Hypothesis in your classroom. Like I mentioned previously, um, your CSM, your customer success manager is available to meet with you one-on-one -on -one for an instructional design consultation at any time. Um, so you basically have unlimited access to us as a resource. So maybe you need technical help setting up an assignment. Great, we're happy to meet with you. If you just want someone to bounce ideas off of for how you might um, implement this in your course, kind of in a pedagogical way, we're here to brainstorm with you like creative ways to use this um, or best ways to use it in your particular course if you just need help. Um, we offer webinars and on-campus visits. Um, so if you would like one of those at your school, let your customer success manager know. We also have a very, very cool video show called Liquid Margins, and I believe there's a new one coming out this Friday. Um, this is a link to our YouTube channel where you can watch past episodes of that. Basically, we collect many of our partners together at other schools and have kind of like a panel style discussion about a wide variety of topics related to social annotation, and it is fascinating. So I highly encourage you to check this out if you're interested um, and view past episodes. And then we also offer these partner workshops like you're attending today. So this is one particularly on getting started in Canvas, but we also offer other workshops on like using multimedia or using the tool with small groups. We offer one on creative ways to use social annotation that really dives into like those pedagogical ideas um, and activities you can use in a class. Um, and you can reach our uh, success team at any time at success at hypothesis. Feel free to use this email address that emails all of us. So your particular CSM will also get that email and be able to um, communicate with you. So that's it for today. Um, we will hang out for a while. If there are any questions, please put those in the chat. Um, thanks, Megan. I'm glad this was helpful. Very, very cool. And please have a great day. I hope this was inspiring to you. If you do have any lingering questions that you'd rather just talk through one-on-one -on -one with your success manager, feel free to use this email address um, and we will get back to you via email. Okay, great. We'll have an excellent day. Thank you so much for coming.